we're very grateful uh, for the opportunity for us to have the privilege to study a little bit further in what God has to say to our hearts. And uh, what we're going to be doing is looking a little bit more closely at the reason that I'm here. And so as we prepare our hearts to receive what God wants to give, let us once again go upon our knees and have a word of prayer, and then let's let the Lord speak to us. And if you can't kneel, just bow your heads, but if you can, let's kneel together and let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful, Lord, for the blessing and the privilege to come together as a family to study your word of truth. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll make your truth plain to our hearts as we must be about our Father's business. Give us the mind of Jesus, we pray, for we ask this with the forgiveness of our sins in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us go to the book of Revelation. No, in fact, Romans chapter 1. Let's go to Romans chapter 1. And when we turn here, we're going to see the great purpose of the gospel. We're going to see that which is entailed in the gospel, and then the great purpose of the gospel. I shared a very important point with you all in our last study when we talked about uh, justification by faith and what it is, the principles that governs justification by faith. Very important. And the two principles, who remembers those two principles we talked about when it comes to justification by faith? Because I'm going to be honest with you. When I read Evangelism, page 189, and it, it talks about how Ellen White says, many have inquired if the third angel's message is justification by faith, and then she says, it is justification by faith in verity, in truth. And I'm thinking to myself, how could that be? You know, justification is the beginning point, glorification is the ending point, sanctification in the middle. Uh, how is justification the third angel's message when that's the last point, the last message? But again, we covered two principles. Who remembers the two principles that we covered of justification by faith that carries over into the experience of sanctification as well as into the experience of glorification? Who remembers that? Okay. Okay, those are the two key points. Don't forget that. God working to lay the glory of man in the dust. That's point number one. Point number two, God doing for man what man cannot do for himself. That is a principle to glory. And this is going to be the ultimate essence of the third angel's message by which if we enter into that experience, it's going to enable us to give the loud cry we will be able to give the loud cry and see God's work finished on the earth. But the first thing he has to do is get our glory to be laid into the dust. And that is not easy. Anytime God tells us something to do or calls us to something we should be and we reject what God has called us to do, we are still allowing our glory to remain. We're still allowing self to stay on the throne of our hearts. And God wants to dethrone self from the heart. That's, that's like phase one. You see, God is going to have a people that's actually going to do what Revelation 14, 12 says. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are they that are trying to keep the commandments of God. Is that what the verse says? No, it says here are they that keep the commandments of God. It's not the two extremes that we're having in Adventism is either we have a group of people that are negating much of what God says and thinking that by following a little bit of what God says, we can still receive all the blessings of heaven. Well, that is what we call a Cain-like religion. Cain did some of what God said, some of not of what of God said, and still expected the full blessings. And we know that Cain's offering was rejected, right? But then you have others who have kind of a very pharisaical approach to the gospel as well. It's another extreme. That other extreme is we become so meticulous in every detail of the law that being bogged down with that, we forget the weightier matters. Judgment, mercy, love. Matthew 23, 23. So God has no use for either one of these types of religion. He does want perfect obedience. And brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. When I, when I study the Bible and I, I read the principles of health reform, 
There are a lot of us that are getting sick and having a lot of problems. And I meet people all the time that do this. They'll say, I was doing everything right, but I still got sick. And I'm just saying, listen, you are in one of two categories. If you're in Job's category, was Job doing everything right? Yes, the Bible says in Job 1.1, it says there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And he was a perfect and upright man who feared God and eschewed evil. Did Job still get sick? Yes, he did. So that, that sickness did not come from violation. That sickness came purely, unadulteratedly, for the glory of God. It was to shut down the argument of Satan. And that sickness did not consume Job. Are you aware of that? It did not consume him. He dealt with it for a period of time, but it didn't consume him. But outside of Job, if we are sick, then it's because of the other reason. Somewhere along the lines, we have violated physical or moral law. So when we begin saying, I have done everything right, I know, but yet I'm sick anyhow, sometimes we got to be careful with that. And, you know, my wife and I, we were doing a training, my family, we were doing a training in, in another state, and, uh, you know, someone was sick, and they was like, I, I was doing everything right. And I'm just realizing you got to be very careful when you say that. Because you're basically saying, I'm following the law of God perfectly. And a lot of us have not done that. When you really Hello. look at God's Hello. health Hello. principles, it takes a complete surrender of Hello. self in order to follow them. Can you guys hear me? That, you you can't me? just intellectually say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to hydrate every day. I'm going to exercise every day. I'm going to dress properly. I'm going I'm, you know, to do all these things. It, it's, it's not that easy. And we will discover our weaknesses and our limitations very quickly. So it's not that God won't have a people that will fully obey his law, both moral and physical. But it's not going to come by might or by power. It's only going to happen as a result of the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. This is the only way. It's the only way. And so it is that God's going to have a people that keep the commandments of God. All of them. Not just the Ten Commandments simply, but all of his law, including his principles of health. All of these things are going to be kept very faithfully. Very faithfully. But it's going to require a degree of self-surrender that many of us still don't have. And again, why don't we have it? It's because God is still in the process of laying that glory in the dust. You and I are Seventh-day Adventists. We know what Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6 tells us. We know that the dead know not anything. And when we are dead to self, we will stop responding back to God when he tells us what to do. You understand that? When we're dead to self, we will stop rebutting when God says, this is my will. Whether it's in diet, whether it's in dress, whether it's in education, when it's in anything. When we're dead to self, be, all that rebutting will finally stop. But as long as self is still alive and even has half of a seat on the throne of our hearts, this is where the arguments and the fussing and the fighting and the frustration of the furthering of the gospel continues. And therefore, God has to sometime allow some humbling agents to come into our lives to break us so we can finally get to a place to truly not just sing it, but live it all to Jesus. I surrender. You understand that? Now, in Romans chapter 1, look at the essence of the gospel, right? So let's look at verses 16 and 17. In Romans 1, 16, the Bible says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, what is the it? It's the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So is the gospel available to both Jew and Gentile? Yes, it is. Now, verse 17 is key. It says, for therein, therein what? In what? The gospel, watch. For therein is the righteousness of God. What's that next word? Revealed. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live 
by faith. Do you know if you study the Bible carefully, there's only two things in the New Testament that God tells us to live by? And they both go together beautifully. God tells us to live by faith. But faith only comes by hearing and hearing by the word. So therefore, Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word. So the truly justified ones, the truly justified people of God will reveal the grace of God, the gospel of God, by how they live, which is by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do you get that? So literally, let me go ahead and pause right here. Thank you. Justification by faith is not limited to an intellectual ascent of Christ our righteousness. It is a living, real, dynamic, absolute, life-changing power that works in us. So when somebody really has received and accepted the gospel, the Bible says therein, in the gospel, is the righteousness of God, but it's not meant to just be known. It's meant to be revealed in your life and in my life. From faith to faith, the just shall live by faith. And the only way to live by faith is in the Word, because if you have faith in anything else, it's not faith. I hope that's not confusing you. If you have faith in anything else but the Word of God, it is not biblical faith. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing by the what? Word of God. So our faith is to be revealed in the Word. The Word of God is what's guiding our faith. You follow that? I know a lot of people who believe a lot of things. You say, Where that's it? where's that in the Bible? They have no idea. And that's when I inform them, my friend, that is presumption. That is presumption. God wants us to live by faith, which is to live by his word. And in that wonderful word is the gospel seed, which the righteousness of God is contained in that gospel. And that's what he wants to reveal through you and I. So when the angel comes and he's given the everlasting gospel, that angel is demonstrating the righteousness of God that they have received by faith in Jesus Christ and of Jesus Christ. Our trust, our absolute trust factor. You know, Jesus dealt with a lot of people, but I want you to go to Matthew 8. Watch this. Matthew, we're looking at the 8th chapter, and I want you to see this. All right, and let's notice what the Bible says in Matthew. We're looking at chapter 8, and let's notice what the text says. When you get there, please let me know by saying amen. Amen. The Bible says in Matthew 8, verse 5, and when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, There came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered. I love the centurion's answer. I wonder if you ever really studied that. The centurion answered, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Now, if you study uh, Mark's account, of this, the Jews actually came to Jesus and said, Lord, this man needs help, and he's worthy of getting help because he has helped us. He's helped our, you know, to build a temple and do all these nice things for us. So they said he's worthy. But this man, speaking for himself, says, I'm not worthy. You understand that? Even when people lift you up, you got to be careful. Volume 1 of the Testimonies to the Church, page 474, the prophet of God says, never, never compliment a minister to his face. How many of us violate this? You hurt us. When you come to us and say, man, you great, man, you the bomb, man, you're powerful, man, you're this, you're that, you're hurting us. Because we always got a little demon whispering in our ear, already telling us how great we are so that we can keep the glory up when God wants to lay it in the dust. You're hurting us. 
when you're constantly telling us how great we are. You are not helping us, not one bit. And so it is that God wants to lay the glory of man in dust. But we always find these slick little ways to just build up man's glory. And so it is that God wants us to understand that this man right here, he didn't let those Jews even get to him. He didn't say, well, Lord, you heard what your own people said, so I guess I am worthy. No. That man had enough and heard enough that he was able to say, regardless of what they say, I am not worthy. And we got to be careful because, you know, <laughs> you know a, lot of, a lot of us, I'm very general, a lot of us are some of the most fake people. I'm saying it broad. We are unbelievably fake. We will literally be like, no, I'm not worthy. And, you know, no, well, you know, it's only by the grace of God. You know, we say those things. And we think because we're bowing our heads and, <laughs> you know, because we, we're doing these things, we think that that's humility. Somebody says, man, you, 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 you are all that. And we say, no, no, glory to God. But there's something inside of deep in our hearts that says, no, actually, glory to me. Now, how do I know this? Number one, because of my own personal experience. But number two, because it's inspired. Christ Object Lessons 159, for those of us who are taking notes. In Christ Object Lessons, page 159, here's what it says. It says, Christ Object Lessons 159. It says, no man can of himself understand his errors. Did you know that? Did you know of our own selves, naturally, we can't understand our errors? We don't know what's wrong with us? It goes on to say, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now look at what it says next, and this is my point. It says, the lips may express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. Did you hear that? The lips can express a poverty of soul that the heart does not acknowledge. It says, while speaking to God of poverty of spirit, the heart is swelling with the conceit of its own superior humility and exalted righteousness. That's how wicked our hearts are. That's how wicked our hearts are. I believe one of the greatest frustrations that the Lord Jesus Christ is having in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary right now is that there's a whole bunch of people he so desperately wants to save, but we are literally busy promoting ourselves before a God who's trying to constantly break us down. I believe it. It's, it's our mass struggle. He's trying to convince us that we actually see ourselves as wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Not so we can fall out in despair, but that we will finally stop trusting our own opinion. Because that's what keeps getting in the way. Every time God wants to do something special in our hearts, we are constantly, but Lord, and we're throwing in all these interjections, and God can't have the success that he wants to have with us. You understand that? Major problem, major issue. But I'm so thankful that when Moses said, Lord, show me your glory, and God says, I'm going to reveal my character, I believe that when God revealed his character to Moses, he did not just reveal his character, he revealed the order of his character. What do I mean? Well, you know, we call him our heavenly what? Father. So we are his children. So when I look at God, I learn a lot about being a father. God actually disciplines his children. Did you know that? Does he discipline us? You better believe it. But he disciplines us. In other words, he only distributes it that he might win us back to his heart. He does not do it to just shun us away. My dad, he used to get mad at us, and he beat us. My dad would be like, you did that again? Get in your room. And then next thing you know, boom, boom, boom. I mean, he's just whipping us through and through. And when we got finished with that annihilation, my father would look at us and say, think about it. And he'd walk out the room. And I'd be sitting there holding myself, holding my legs and all this other stuff in pain. Thank God that's not how my father died. He died a converted man. 
But what I'm saying to you is that's not what God, God doesn't discipline us and just say, think about it, and then walks away. God might discipline us. Yes, it'll be painful. But my brothers and sisters, in the end, he picks us up. And he puts those nice, wonderful balm that comes from his heart upon our wounds. And he looks at us in love and he says, did you get the message? And sometimes we actually say, no. And God says, we're going to have to go through the education again. Until finally we can say, Lord, I got the message. I got it. That's why Ellen White would say sometimes, sometimes when a parent is getting ready to spank their child and discipline them with the rod, if that child demonstrates true repentance, she says there's no longer a need to use the rod. Because what's the purpose of the rod? It's to bring them to repentance. You understand that? But we parents, children, just so you understand, we, we, we know how when you're apologizing to spare a discipline versus apologizing because you see your sin. So you can fool some people, but you can't fool God. And if our minds are united with God, God will tell us they're faking it. Give them the rod. You understand that? Now, Moses says, Lord, show me your glory. God says, all right, I'll show you my goodness. I'll proclaim my name. But then watch what God does. God now introduces his character. Yes, he is a God of discipline, but I'm so thankful. Look at the flow of how God reveals his character. It says in Exodus 34, verse 5, it says, The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with them there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God. First thing he reveals about himself, merciful. Then he says, gracious. Then he says, long-suffering. Then he says, abundant in goodness and truth. Then he says, keeping mercy for thousands. And if we still don't get it, then he says, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers. So my wife and I, we covenanted, if we're going to discipline our children, they must first see mercy. They must see daddy and mommy being gracious. They need to see us being long-suffering. They need to see us being abundant in goodness and truth. But if after all that, they still don't get it, that's when it's time to have a special appointment. And that's when it's time to say, all right, we're now going to have to go ahead to the disciplinary action. Oh, no, 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 I'm sorry. No. And now it's going to have to be carried through. You understand that? God is merciful, brothers and sisters. Eventually, mercy runs out, judgment begins, but he's slow in that process. He's not fast. So the Lord is saying to all of us, listen, I, I want to get you to a place where you and I can be so surrendered to his will that we will stop rebutting, that we will stop kicking against the pricks, that we'll stop fighting him. When he gives laws of health, he says, I gave this to you for your happiness. Please do what I say. I don't care how much you hate being sick, God hates it double. God hates it triple. I don't care how much you hate being poor, broke, and, and not able to even pay for your necessities. God says, I never wanted that for you. The Bible says in Proverbs 30, Solomon the wise man said, two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die. Proverbs 37 through 9. He says, two things have I required of thee, deny me them not before I die. And Solomon, under inspiration, says, give me neither poverty nor riches. You understand that? He says, just give me what's sufficient for me. So I'm not going to go around asking for a bunch of stuff that God didn't even tell me to ask for. Some people think it's virtuous not being able to take care of your needs. God says, no, that's never been my plan. But some of us are so busy chasing the dollar trying to get rich that the camel sooner has the opportunity to get into the kingdom through an eye of a needle than we do. God says, neither one of those. He says, I want you to get to a place that you will be satisfied with the sufficient provision that I give to you. Now, my brothers and sisters, God is getting ready to come. He's getting ready to burst through the clouds and bring his family home. Prior to doing that, a terrible crisis is going to come upon the world. The Spirit of God, we already see it, is being withdrawn. 
That's why some of these crimes today, they're, 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 wicked is an understatement. Some of the actions and the activities we see today testifies that people, their probation has closed. They are demon-possessed. God wants us to understand that while his spirit is being withdrawn from many who have constantly rejected and rejected and rejected and rejected, God's spirit is also being poured out on many of people. And I like that part. And there are people that some of us can rub our eyes and take a double look at some folks and say, that's you? In other words, people who normally were not humble, and all of a sudden we're seeing the most Christ-like humility in their characters. People who normally were hotheads, always getting angry and ready to get into some type of verbal or even physical fight, and now all of a sudden, these people are becoming soft and docile. And even when people do the most mean things to them, they're not retaliating and responding. There are people that God is demonstrating clear evidence His Spirit is taking control of their lives. And that's a good thing. And I just want to be counted amongst that number, and I know you do too, amen? It's the people that are filled with the Spirit of God that will be able to do a very special work of God. And I want to give you just a small picture of that special work. Because like we studied last night from Ecclesiastes 1.9, history has a tendency to repeat itself. Go to the book of Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I was going to bring out some additional points on the centurion, but we'll do it at a different time. Revelation chapter 2, this is where we get into the seven churches. Um, I'd love to go through a lot of these things here. Okay, that's nice. The seven churches of Revelation, question. The seven churches of Revelation, those, the messages that came to the seven churches in Asia Minor, were those messages just for the people at the time that received the letters? Or were they for times after that? What would you say? How many of us say the letters that came to the seven churches in Asia Minor, they were just for the people of that time who received the letters? How many says that? Okay. How many of us say that the letters that came to the churches of Asia Minor were not just for the people of that time, but it was for successive generations. How many of you say that? Okay. Now, what Bible verse do you have to prove that these letters were for churches of successive generations? Why are you so quiet? See, Lord willing, we come back to do this training. I, I'm, I'm going to give this to you every time. Every time I say, what, do you believe that? Yes, I believe it. I'm going to say, okay, where's that in the Bible? <laughs> Romans 15, 4, these things were written aforetime for our learning, etc. Somebody may say, what does that got to do with Revelation 2 and the seven churches of Asia Minor? Somebody could throw that back at us, okay? We just want to know how to answer it if they throw it back at us. Now, the reason I'm doing this is because volume 5 of the Testimonies to the Church, page 707, says... There are many who profess to have a knowledge of present truth who really don't know what they believe. Then the next sentence says, they do not understand the evidences of their faith. So sometimes we believe things, but when people say, where's your evidence, we don't know where it is. And as a result of not knowing where the evidence is, we start saying, well, then why do I believe it? And that's how the devil starts messing with your head, and before you know it, he'll talk you right out of all the truths of the Word of God. So I'm asking you not to embarrass. I'm asking you not to try to play any games. I'm asking you, where is it, so that you know? Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. Hold fast till I come. There are a lot of people who spiritualize the idea of till I come. I don't know how many you might have run into. But for now, that's a decent verse. We can, we can say that that's a decent verse. Yes. Somebody could say, yes, all Scripture is God-breathed. God, God has inspired all these people to write. But they're still asking, but what does that, how does that help me see that the letters to the seven churches applies a future tense from the days of those churches? They, they may not make that connection, Brother Baker. So that's all. We, we want to help them make that connection, okay? Yes? Oh, my sister. Okay, Revelation 22, 7, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so my sister, behold, I come quickly. Uh, blessed are those who, who hold to these truths. Is that what the verse said? That keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Okay, and they say, yeah, I get that. There are some things in Revelation that apply to our time, but they're saying, but the letters to the seven churches, they're saying, how does that apply beyond the time that the letters were written to those churches? That's the question. Brother Craig. Ah. Okay. Okay, very good. So, Brother, Brother Craig uh, is using something called typology. We'll talk about that. Um, he's using the principles of typology in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, where Paul goes through all this stuff that happened to Israel, and then he gets to verse 11. It says, all these things happen unto them for types, and they're written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. So Paul is pointing out how whatever happened to Israel of old was a type, a symbol of what's going to happen in reality to those living in the end of time. And then basically 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12, kind of brings out that same point. Overall, good principle, yes. But somebody says, but what does that have to do with Revelation 2? Where all these seven churches are written, how can we truly substantiate that these letters are written for generations beyond their time? Yes. In where? Verse 29. Verse 29 of Revelation 2? Yes. Okay. He that has an ear, let him hear. What the Spirit says unto the church. All right. Somebody says, yeah. He's saying, those of you at that time who has an ear to hear, let you hear what the Spirit is saying to you at that time. Somebody, I'm, listen, everything I'm saying to you, once you get out of this church and get beyond these walls and start going into people's homes that are Jehovah's Witnesses, that are Baptists, that are non-denominationals, that are Pentecostal and apostolic, that are orthodox, that are church of God in Jesus Christ. Once you start sitting with these folks, you will see that everything I'm saying to you right now, you're going to say, praise the Lord, Brother Lemon, prepared us for that. Because I'm telling you, you're going to run into that. You're going to run into that. I have spent 25 years having the privilege of studying with precious souls from many, many, many faiths. And it's been a blessing because it makes me think harder when I go through Scripture. You understand that? So you'll see it for those of you who are not engaged in very, very uh, deliberate, effective gospel work. You'll, you'll see it. And it's one of the richest blessings. You'll learn a lot. There's a simpler way that all of you can answer my question. Uh, nobody has done it yet. But there is a simpler way, I think. I think. I believe. You can critique me on it. But there's a simpler way. So I'll go over it after two more. My brother with the blue and then my sister in the back, and that'll be the last. Go ahead. Okay, what verse is that? Revelation 4, 4, 1. So now we're getting into trumpets. So somebody said, what the trumpet's about? But didn't it say, trump didn't it say trumpet? 
So is this seven trumpets? So is this the seven churches? But how do you know that it's referring to something that happened after the seven churches? But what, what is the this? Is that the seven churches or is that something else from Revelation 3? Is the seven churches after Revelation 3 even though it's Revelation 4? But the seven churches is in Revelation 2 and then it goes... Okay, so then there's a judgment scene. So there's a judgment scene that's happening when? Okay. Very good. Now, what, what I'm doing, quite honestly, is just what they're going to do to you. They're, they're going to say judgment? What do you mean judgment? Trumpets? What do you mean trumpet? So n- what they're going to do now is they're going to... S- Sometimes you can answer a question that will produce 5 to 10 to 15 to 20 more questions. You understand that? And then what happens is now we got an even bigger job to do because now i got to still answer the first question along with the other 5, 10, or 15, or 20. So that's the only reason why I'm throwing that at you because somebody's going to be like, huh? In other words, we got to learn how to answer Scripture as if we are talking to people that don't have a clue of what we believe and what we understand to be true. Last one, my sister. It sets the tone. Correct. And it, and it does set the tone. Somebody could still say yes. And for the seven churches, it set the tone for them. And then for the folks in Revelation 4, it set a tone for them. And then for the folks in Revelation, you get it? And they keep going. So tell me if this helps. You ready? Oh, she was referring to Revelation 1, 1 to 3 and verse 3, how it says, Blessed are they that hear, read, and keep the sayings that are in this book. Um, unto the coming of the Lord. So obviously it, it expands over a period of time. So here's, here's, tell me if this helps. Revelation 1, 19 and 20. Let's look at what it says. It says, write the things which thou hast what? Seen. So was it seen presently? Yes, it was seen. Present, right? Okay, watch this. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are, so what's that? Present, past, or future? Present. And the things which shall be when? Hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Was that pertaining to what the messages were going to be to the seven churches? Yes. Did it acknowledge what was present tense? Did it acknowledge that? But did it not also say, and the things which shall be? Remember, the message is to the seven churches, but it's not only that which is present their time, but the things which shall be when? Hereafter. So does it show that it will go beyond that present time? Yes. It's a message that's for the churches at the time, but it will also have an application after their time. Are you following that? What do you think? Honestly, what do you think? I'm asking you. I'm not, I'm not an expert. For real, I'm not. I'm, I'm just asking you. I like simplicity. That, that's, that's all I'm trying to I like simplicity. So what I'm trying to do is show the messages that belong to the seven churches was not just that which was applicable at the time, but it will also have an application after that time. That was all I wanted to show. Yes, sister. Yes. Oh, well, that's one of the key points. The key point is that many a times the answer is right in the very verses applying to the subject at hand. Like in my, in my understanding of gospel Bible work, 
One of the greatest mistakes Bible workers make is they move away from the verse in question and jump to a whole bunch of other verses other places. I don't recommend that. My first, I am going to teach you, and I'm teaching you now. The first initiative is always look at verses before, verses after. Always do that. Before you start jumping, oh, over here, over here, over here, just look at the verses before and verses after of the verse in question. And you'll find, oh, man, if we just go back a few verses, there go the answer right there. Because, watch this, if you look at Revelation 1, right? That's Revelation 1, 19 and 20, those are the last verses of chapter 1. Now, if anybody knows how the Bible came together, the Bible did not come together in chapters, it was a long flowing letter. So chapter 2 is a continuation of the discussion in chapter 1. You understand that? So verses 19, those are the last verses of chapter 1. Chapter 2 is the intro to the seven churches. So that's the reason why I believe that, that that's a super simple way to just say it goes beyond the time period of the actual seven churches. It, it goes beyond that. Now, why is that important to us? Why, why I spend all that time trying to establish that point? It's for this reason right here. When you look at the, the, the churches, right, I know you can't see that. that that's just terrible. So just, just understand that what, what I'm simply doing here is I'm walking down each of the churches and what they represent, okay, what they represent in different things. Uh, if you want, send me an email. Say, hey, send me that chart. I'll send it to you, okay? I'll give you my email at the end. But here's the key. This church right here catches my attention. That church era of time. That church era of time is the church of Philadelphia. What does Philadelphia mean? Brotherly love. Brotherly love okay? Brotherly love. Did the church of Philadelphia have any rebuke? God had no rebuke for the church of Philadelphia, right? God simply tell them, told them, hold fast to your faith. Keep doing what you're doing. The Church of Philadelphia was a very beautiful time period in the gospel dispensation. And one of the great reasons why was because they not only understand, understood the words of God, but they were unfolding the final pieces that would bring the law and the prophets back together again. Okay? And that's why you see that, you know, it was pretty much up until the 1840s. That's where you got the Church of Philadelphia. Okay? So what, what movement do we think of when you think of around the 1840s? Millerite. Can I recommend that you don't say Millerite? Is that all right? Unless you're talking about America? Were there people in Scandinavia? Were there people in Africa? Were there people in India that was telling everybody, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come? Were there people in other parts of the world pointing to 1844? Yes. So would it be wiser, instead of saying the Millerite, because there were no Millerites in Scandinavia. There were no Millerites in, in Africa. You know what there was? There was Adventists. It was the Advent movement. Is that all right? So when we talk about the movement that represented the Philadelphian time frame, we're talking about the Advent movement. Is it okay to say that? If you say that, now you're speaking in a worldwide context because that's what John the Revelator saw. He didn't see it just happening in America. He saw it happening all over the world. Okay? Very good. Now, knowing this, I like this principle of brotherly love. When you look at it, Philadelphia... 2 Peter 1. Look, look, let's look at Peter's ladder of grace. 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's look at the ladder of grace for a minute. Pretty powerful. In 2 Peter chapter 1, watch what the Bible says from verses 4 to 10. It's a beautiful ladder of grace. I believe it's a ladder of order. And the Bible says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 4, if you're there, please say amen. The Bible says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, what comes next? Brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, what's the last one? So right before, th there's no way, when you think of charity, the highest love, the agape, that is the epitome of the character of God. Is that right? 
love, the agape love. No one will reflect the full character of God until they first have a brotherly love and kindness one to another. You understand that? No one will reflect the full character of God until we first have a brotherly kindness and love one to another. Okay? That's why I believe right now is a very special time in our church. Because God is allowing a lot of dirt that is happening in our church to come out in the public. And God is watching how his people respond. And there are a lot of responses to what's happening in the church, but a lot of it is not reflecting the brotherly kindness and brotherly love that God desires us to have. It's a very serious thing. I am afraid when I look at what's captivating the minds of many of God's people in such a time as this in earth's history. Because there are a lot of us, we have become masters at identifying the weaknesses and faults of others in the church. I would imagine there's some ministries that that's the only reason why they're successful. Listen to what I'm saying to you. There are some ministries right now that nobody would even listen to them were it not for the fact that they are guaranteed to tell you some of the latest dirt happening in God's church. Nobody would listen to them if they just simply taught the everlasting gospel. That's deep what I'm sharing with you. And I would challenge any preacher... How about taking a break from all of your uh, sanctified gossip and how about you just teach the first, second, and third angel's message and let's just see how many people still watch your program. I wonder how many more people would still watch their programs. Because there's one thing the human mind loves is to hear how messed up somebody else's life is while they can't do nothing about it. God is not pleased with a lot of the foolishness going on in this church right now. But he has a plan to clean it up. But the key is, is that brotherly kindness is something we need to understand a little bit better. And when you think of the term brotherly kindness, or uh, forgive me here, kindness, I thought that was interesting. Did you know the word kindness in the Greek in 2 Peter 1 is actually the word Philadelphia? Isn't that amazing? In other words, if I'm entering into the experience of Peter's ladder, the first thing on the ladder was what? Add to your faith. That's the first thing. Then it says virtue. And then to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. You know, and it just walks you up the ladder. But eventually, God says to all his people, I want you to manifest the Philadelphia spirit. I want you to have brotherly kindness one to another. We are not repeating the time period of Philadelphia. We can't do that. But certainly the, the Philadelphian experience, the brotherly love, the love of the brethren. And like I told you before, does love rebuke? Yeah, we saw that. Revelation 3.19, love does rebuke. But in all rebukes, it's redemptive. It always draws the heart back to God. It doesn't just repel there's a lot of people right now that's rebuking purely to repel, to tell everybody, get away from these evil people and all these other things. And the question is, well, where's your redemptive message? How do you win that wicked soul back to God? Sometimes the best people are saying is repent or be lost. I'm glad that Jesus said a lot more than that. Well, charity. It's a love feast. When we have brotherly kindness, we will have a feast of love that we will be able to share amongst the people of God, amongst the world, and the people will know and understand who God is. Now, the reason why I'm pointing that out is because up until now, everything I've been sharing with you has been about getting the heart right. 
Because if we're going to go out into the field of Portland and any other adjacent cities in Oregon, we have to understand that there's a lot that God wants to clean up in our own hearts before we go ahead and try to start cleaning up other people's lives. God, however, does want to get us to a place that as he helps us gain some principles in our lives, we are better prepared now to help others. Once God can solve some of your problems, you can now be an instrument in his hand to solve the problems of others. But if God hasn't even solved any of your problems, it's probably not time for you to preach or teach yet. It's probably not time for you and I to go ahead because the gospel's a wonderful simplifier of life's problems. That's Ministry of Healing 363. So if none of your problems are solved and you are just overwhelmed by all of your problems, it's probably not time for you and I to go ahead and start trying to solve everybody else's problems. But if God has at least helped you solve one problem, well, that's just one way closer you can help somebody else solve one problem. If God has helped you solve five problems, then now you can go ahead and find some people that fit under the category of those five problems. You can help them solve those five problems. You get that? That's what God is saying. Now, when I think about this statement, it means a lot to me. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within. Reflecting Christ 234, paragraph 4. I really want you to think about your life, family. I'm serious. Do you have disinterested care, love, and concern for other people? I'm not talking about those of us who serve people for a fee because it's not disinterested because I don't know if you're serving me because I am going to equate to a level of cash flow to you. So Jesus wants a type of ministry. Nothing wrong with serving for a fee, depending on what you do. That's not the issue. What I am saying is, is that God wants to get us to a place that we know how to serve in a disinterested manner. Nothing comes back to me. I am purely giving of myself to help improve your life and make it better. This is the context of the completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others, independent of whatever comes back to you. That shows that we really are possessors of Christ's character. We have received, he has solved our problems, and now we want to go ahead and help solve other people, people's problems purely because we are compassionate to other people. This, this, is, this is real gospel. If all you and I do is just avoid bad music, avoid bad dress, avoid bad diet, avoid bad associations, and we avoid everybody, we're like a bunch of down-low Seventh-day Adventist monks and nuns. God says, that's not what I asked you to do. God says he wants you to embrace all these truths, get our hearts and homes turned around in such a beautiful way that, Lord, I cannot help but to share this with others. Something just burst inside of you supernaturally. Lord, I got, I, got, I got to tell somebody else. That. I got to bring somebody to my house. My home is so much in order now, Father, that I want to show people this is what a happy marriage looks like. This is what a happy home looks like. Just can't help it. No sooner than one comes to Christ, there's born within their heart a desire to share Jesus with others. No sooner. So this is what God wants to accomplish, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, I'm going to go past that. Oh, well, no, this is, eh, no. Our early success. This is my point, family. When you look at the early success of the Seventh-day Adventists, it's very powerful. I want you to just get an idea, the early success of the movement that, that, that ultimately became the Seventh-day Adventist church. Um, this is an observation that I just think is so powerful for us to consider. Did you know church growth should be a natural byproduct of sound biblical understanding of our purpose, mission, and identity. Do you agree with that? Church growth should be a natural byproduct of sound biblical understanding of our purpose, mission, and identity. If there's one thing that every Seventh-day Adventist church needs is a better understanding of our purpose, mission, and identity. You go to somebody and say, what's a Seventh-day Adventist? We get all sorts of strange answers. We're not clear on what is our purpose, what is our mission, what is our identity. We got to get clear on that, folks. You just got to get clear on it. 
Now, the more we understand that, the natural byproduct will be church growth. Natural byproduct. So when you show me a dead church or a church that's just languishing, losing members, losing members, losing members, that's a problem. That, that, is, a, that is a clear testimony. There's a disconnect. If we got a church that can fit 800 people, there should be 800 people here. If we got a church that can only fit 800 and there's only 150, 200 people here, something is wrong in our understanding of our purpose, our mission, and our identity, especially if that's going on year in and year out. Something's wrong. There's a disconnect. You understand that? Now, notice this. Did you know from 1872 to 1902, the seven-day Adventist church's membership increased over 400%? If anybody takes the time to go to the General Conference website, you can actually pull all this data. From 1872 to 1902, the Seventh-day Adventist membership increased over 400%. Now watch this. From 1902 to 1930, the church only increased by 180%. From 1930 to 1960, 150%. From 1960 to 1990, 200%. From 1990 to 2005, 150%. What is my point? My point is we have never seen growth in our church, like the time of 1872 to 1902. And you know what? The last original pioneer to Seventh-day Adventist Church died in 1924. 1924, I believe it was Loughborough. Now watch this. When the new generations came into the church, things started changing. I mean, as early as 1932, the General Conference president said, if our pioneers were alive and saw the church, they wouldn't even recognize it. In other words, the Seventh-day Adventist church started changing as early as the 1930s. That's why if you, if, if, man, can you imagine if Loughborough or James White or, or Uriah Smith or, or any of the pioneers, can you imagine if they walked into a Seventh-day Adventist church in 2017, the average church? They would be like, what is this church? I, I don't even know what this is. Because many of us have strayed very, very far away from the original foundations. During that time period, those people were on fire. Many of them came out of that Philadelphian experience, and they maintained that spirit as they worked for the master. I want to show you some of the work that they did, because I believe that if we want to see the kind of growth in God's church today that took, time, that took place in times past, it is going to be imperative to understand what were those people possessed with that brotherly love? What were they doing that caused such tremendous growth? Well, the first thing is they understood their purpose, mission, and identity. So that's your first work right there. If you don't understand the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the mission of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the identity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, if you don't understand that, like really clearly, family, don't get caught up. Don't make that mistake to say, I'm an elder. I got I to gotta front. I got to act like I know. Listen, we're living in a time we got to be very humble if you are a pastor, an elder, a deacon, a deaconess, and you don't know, be honest with your own heart and say, I don't know, but by the grace of God, that won't be my testimony for long. Amen. That's all God wants. But we have to understand what is our purpose, what is our mission, what is our identity. Then, as we understand that, we can repeat the work. So let's take a look at the work. What caused such rapid growth in the early Seventh-day Adventist church? And some of these things might surprise you. Um, Seventh-day Baptist, why did I put that there? Well, there was Seventh-day Baptist before there was Seventh-day Adventist. I hope you knew that. In other words, there was people keeping the Sabbath before Seventh-day Adventist came on the scene. Now, we, however, began to grow at such rapid pace that I want you to watch what happened when we started getting interviewed by other denominations. The Seventh-day Baptist said something that I thought was amazing. The Seventh-day Baptist Sabbath recorder of December 28, 1908, we reprinted it in the Review and Herald, January 14, 1909. But here's what it said. It said, all Seventh-day Adventist clergymen are missionaries, not located pastors. It says and are busy preaching, teaching, and organizing churches the world over. Did you know 
that God never wanted a pastor to be a local pastor that you see every Sabbath over your church? That was never God's design. That's the world's, but not God's plan. And where do you get this from? Go to Acts chapter 20. You read Acts the 20th chapter. Look at it. Go through the book of Acts. You will literally see that the ministers, the overseers, were busy going about preaching, teaching, and setting up churches all over the place. They were not located pastors just constantly staying at the same church, hovering over the same church, helping the church think and believe and function. That was not the mission of the pastor. It never was, and it should not be. Watch this. I'm not done yet. And listen, the Seventh-day Baptist says, ah, this is what those Seventh-day Adventists are doing. Literally, it was, it was amazing, but it's deeper than that. Watch this. The plain dealer. This was actually, the, the plain dealer still exists today. You can Google it. It's a public secular newspaper. The plain dealer, miss a day, miss a lot. I think they still go by that. Look at this. There was an interview that took place with one of our elders in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in one of our regional conferences. It says, some facts and figures gathered from Elder Star." how they have grown in 40 years and what they believe. So Seventh-day Adventists were being interviewed. I, I love the fact that we were growing so much that literally secular media and other denominations were interviewing us because they could not understand why you're having such explosive growth. Our growth caught the attention of the other churches and the secular world. Now watch this. It says, by what means, this is what the news asks, by what means have you carried forward your work so rapidly? The answer, well, in the first place, replied the elder, we have no settled pastors. Our churches are taught largely to take care of themselves, while nearly all of our ministers work as evangelists in new fields. If we could have a revival like this. If we could have a revival like this, where our pastors understand you're not supposed to be sitting around all the time governing over the church. You're supposed to be teaching the members how to run the church. Take care of it yourselves. And I know churches today, I want a pastor. I want a pastor. I want a pastor. You don't even realize God blessed you. God is actually teaching you, run it yourself. Amen. Not in some rambunctious, disorganized way. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm talking about. God is an organized body, and I thank the Lord for that. Organization is of biblical order. Read Exodus 18. It is of biblical order. But what I'm saying is, is that God wants us to understand that we don't need someone lording over us, thinking for us, telling us what to do, when to do, how to do. If you got to function like that, why are you an elder? The elders are supposed to run the church. You understand that? Now watch this. The Kalamazoo Telegraph. This, this is amazing. This, this is all over. The Kalamazoo Telegraph, another secular resource. Wanted to find out from Adventists, how are y'all growing so much? Ken Wright. You remember D.M. Ken Wright? D.M. Ken Wright was one of our, uh, you know, one of our major evangelists, he was like a C.D. Brooks, Mark Finley, and a whole bunch of other great evangelists all blended into one. I mean, he was an incredible soul winner in the Seventh-day Adventist church. He got to a place where, unfortunately, he started to think to himself, man, I'd be a lot more popular were it not for this distinct SDA message. And he started getting a little bit, you know, you know he, he wanted to get broad and he started veering away from principles. Ellen White had to warn him a lot. And eventually, Ken Wright apostatized and left the movement. Now, when Ken Wright left the movement, look at what this says. It says, in the quotation taken from the Kalamazoo Telegraph, we find this statement. At the time, he dissolved his connection with them. In other words, Ken Wright dissolved his connection with the Seventh-day Adventist Church. He left. I wonder how many churches Ken Wright was pastor over. It says... At the time he dissolved his connection with them, he had the charge of 18 churches in Michigan. One pastor over 18 churches. This is what God wanted. 
You understand that? One pastor, and it was over 18 churches. It says the facts in this case are these. Seventh-day Adventist churches maintain their regular worship without the assistance of any located pastors, leaving our entire ministry free to act as evangelists in new fields. As a consequence, many of our churches pass long periods without any preaching, and consequently conference committees aim to arrange the labor in the state so that ministers will occasionally be at liberty to visit the churches to help and encourage them in the Christian life by a few meetings. George Butler, Review and Herald, 1888. So literally, God understood, I want my people to take care of themselves. We, sometimes... Having a pastor over a church, lording over a church, is like watching TV. When you watch TV, you know the most dangerous thing about watching TV? The television does the thinking for you. And it sets your brain in a very dormant state. And therefore, you're not able to really think through as much because the TV is constantly changing from shot to shot to shot. So the TV is doing the thinking for you, so you're getting less mental exercise. That's why, parents, even too much good TV will damage your child. You understand that? You must get your children to love books. Get them to love books. Get them to love to read. Because when you read, it makes you imagine. When you imagine, you're exercising your mind. Because when we think, we think in pictures. You understand that? Get your children loving to read. Get yourself loving to read. You got to get to a place that you stop watching gospel lessons on DVD. You got to get to a place you got to read. There's nothing that develops the mind like reading the Bible. Nothing. It'll expand your mind. And you know what will happen? When it expands your mind, you become sharper businessmen. You become sharper employees. You become sharper husbands, sharper wives, sharper mothers, sharper fathers. Literally, everything else you get sharper at once you start to tax your brain on reading the Bible. But so it is that a lot of times when we get pastors, some of our mindsets is when we get a pastor, whew, now we can put all the work on him. And we get him working for us. We get him thinking for us. We get him getting all the taxation of the brain on, for us. And all he does is he gets sick. Get sick, ends up with cancer, and then we got the nerve to say, pray for the pastor. You probably caused that cancer. Listen to what I'm saying. Sometimes we overwork people. I don't know if you remember what the prophet says. When we do more brain work than body work, we unbalance our nervous system. What are the diseases that come as a result of a weakened and debilitated and unbalanced nervous system? Lou Gehrig's disease, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. A lot of these things start happening. Why? Because there are people that's giving so much mental time to work and then not even having time to do physical exertion. A lot of us will do that. We'll get a praise the Lord, we got a pastor. Load him up with work. Make him as intemperate as possible in the name of Jesus. And then when he gets sick and all of a sudden he has tremors and all this stuff, multiple sclerosis or whatever the disease is, and all of a sudden, we, oh, now we got to pray and fast for him so we can get him well, so we can get him back into the same rut that got him into that disease in the first place. Got to be careful, family. The people are to be taught, you take care of the church. God has given us everything in Scripture to know how to take care of the church. As elders... Get your pastors out into dark places. Are there some dark places around here? Are there some places without a church? Are there some places that have not heard the gospel? That's where our ministers are supposed to be. Not showing up here every Sabbath to give you a good one hour, 30 minute sermon. Do a few visitations in the week. Those are nice. Those are good things, necessary. But my brothers and sisters, the pastors are called to be evangelists. They got to go to mission fields. Now watch this. A.G. Daniels. We have not settled our ministers over churches as pastors to any large extent. In some of the very large churches, we have elected pastors, but as a rule, we have held ourselves ready for field service, evangelistic work, and our brethren and sisters have held themselves ready to maintain their church services and carry forward their church work without settled pastors. 
and I hope, this is a conference president, he says, and I hope this will never cease to be the order of affairs in this denomination. Now, I want you to watch carefully what he says. It's almost like he was a prophet. I want you to watch carefully what he says would happen if we had pastors just lording over the church. Watch what it says. It says, for when we cease our forward movement, work, our forward movement work and begin to settle over our churches to stay by them and do their thinking and their praying and their work that is to be done, then our churches will begin to what? Weaken and to lose their life and spirit and become paralyzed and fossilized and our work will be on a retreat. He said, this is what will happen if people start relying upon the pastors to do all this work for them. A.G. Daniels in an address to a ministerial institute in Los Angeles, California, March 1912. Continuing, Ellen White, our ministers are not to hover over the churches, regarding the churches in some particular place as their special care. It always challenges me when I hear a pastor say, this is my church. I'm like, excuse me, it is not your church. It is God's church. I know one evangelist that seriously, a pastor, unfortunately, in the spirit of arrogance, the pastor was like, this is my church, and so on, and he told that evangelist, he said, you will never come back on this church pulpit. You, if you ever come back, he said, it'll be over my dead body. He died shortly thereafter, and that evangelist was back on that pulpit preaching the word. This church belongs to nobody but Jesus. It's his church. It is not yours if you're a pastor. It's not your church. You are the under-shepherd, and you are the chiefest of servants to the saints. But we are not to act like this is my church under my special care and so on and so on. We can't do that like that. Sometimes that mindset cripples the people of God. And it goes on to say, and our churches should not feel jealous and neglected if they do not receive ministerial labor. They should themselves take up the burden and labor most earnestly for souls. Believers are to have root in themselves, striking firm root in Christ, that they may bear fruit to his glory. Got to get to work. What I love about the fact that if we don't have pastors hovering over our churches, it means that I have a greater responsibility as an elder to work. And the problem is most of us don't like to work. And that's why it's always easier when you have a pastor to say, you get it done. That's why you get that tithe. So go get the work done. And we will let that man burn himself out. And like I said, when he gets sick, we got the nerve. We have the audacity. Let's hover together and pray for him. And sometimes God don't answer that prayer because he's like, all y'all going to do is kill him. Because if he gets well, praise the Lord, his cancer went in remission. Amen. Pastor, how soon can you be back? So you can do it all over again. That's why God, I'm, I'm very, I believe with all of my heart, that's why God sometimes does not heal pastors, many pastors. Because he's like, y'all were intemperate in your pastoral leadership, and all you're going to do is get well to go back and kill yourself. And so God in love says to many of pastors, I'm not going to raise you back up. I'll save you, but I'm not going to raise you back up if you're just going to go back. I believe with all of my heart Jesus wants to heal more than we know. But he cannot heal us just to make us better healthy sinners. You understand that? He wants to help us. Now, this is piece number one. Now, watch this. Here's piece number two. In addition to not having settled pastors, what did it look like when the church went to work? Well, in the first place, replied the elder, we have no settled pastors. Our churches are taught largely to take care of themselves while nearly all of our ministers work as evangelists in new fields. Now, watch this. In the winter, they go out into the churches, halls, or schoolhouse and raise up believers. In the summer, we use tents, pitching them in the cities and villages where we teach the people these doctrines. This year, we shall run about 100 tents in this way. When's the last time you had a tent meeting out here? 
And then when's the last time your conference, how many tent meetings does your conference hold in a year? You understand? Listen, family, what I'm trying to show you is, is that we have the privilege of repeating history. We can actually repeat the good side of history. We can have that Philadelphia in 1872 to that 1902 experience. Those people that came out of that Philadelphian experience maintained the Philadelphian spirit while others were falling into Laodicea. And as a result of that brotherly love, which also produced Christ-like love, they worked for the master. And I want you to watch what kind of work takes place when Jesus has possession of our hearts. It Not only did they hold 100 tents in one year, one conference, 100 tents in one year. Then it says this, besides these, we send out large numbers of what? Called porters. How many of you do literature evangelism? That's not a large number. I saw like one and a half hands. But this, this, is, this is how many. Somebody says, what's a call porter? Those are the people who take the truth filled literature, the literature that contains the truth for this time, and they knock on people's doors with the love of Christ in their hearts, and they get those individuals to buy that book and trade God for God. You understand what I just said? To trade God for God. You know a lot of people, their money is their God. So we take truth-filled literature, we give them the story of the true God, and we take away that false God, which is their money. And that helps support the work keep going. Amen? Amen. Now watch this. It says, besides this, we send out not small numbers, not medium numbers, large numbers of cult porters with our tracts and books who visit the families and teach them the Bible. So what else are the cult porters doing? They're teaching the Bible, which means they have to know the Bible. So that means the church has to transition into a school. The members have to be taught how to teach the Bible so that when they go out to do their call portal work and somebody buys a book, that they can see through discernment and say, you know what, I think this person needs a Bible study. And they can go ahead and teach them the Word of God. Continuing, it says, last year we employed about 125 in this manner. It was not a gain. This is why the 400 percent took place. It says, last year we employed about 125 in this manner. Bible reading is another class of work. The workers go from house to house holding Bible readings with from 1 to 20 individuals. You know, there used to be a Sabbath school. Some of you are going to remember this. We used to have Sabbath school. I loved it. We used to have Sabbath school, and people would say this at the conclusion of the Sabbath school class. They would say, all right, uh, Mary, um, how, many, how many Bible studies did you do this week? They would say, John, how many Bible studies, how many tracts did you give out? There was, an, there was an assessment in that Sabbath school class, how many people are working for the master? And people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I gave five Bible studies. Oh, I had three visitations. I had this. It was beautiful. It was beautiful. And I remember I saw quick, I got the lesson quick, sat in that Sabbath school class, and they were like, you know, so-and-so, what you do? And I'm looking at this guy. Oh, I did five Bible studies. Looking at this person. Oh, I gave out 13 tracts. Looked at this person. Oh, I did about 10 visitations. And Dwayne, how much you do? I was like, great question. I didn't do anything. This is what y'all do? Yeah, man, we spend time during the week sharing Jesus. Really? I had a very good training in certain ways, not in every way. But in certain ways, especially with activity, I had a very good training in my early Adventist years. Those people were very busy. We need to get back to some of those Sabbath schools where we can do that assessment at the end of the Sabbath school class. How many, how many Bible, to, how many visitations, how many this, how many that? Not to embarrass people, but to motivate us to get to work, to understand God didn't give you a week to be selfish, and then you can pour out a whole bunch of unselfishness within one 24-hour period. It's all week we're supposed to be doing this. Now, it says, the workers from house to house holding Bible readings with from 1 to 20 individuals. Last year, they gave 10,000 of such Bible readings. At the same time, we had employed 300 canvassers, constantly canvassing the country and selling our larger works. Call porters, smaller tracts and books. Canvassers, the larger books, the MAGA books and, and the, the, the big, thick encyclopedia books, those type of things. Then... In addition to this, every church has a missionary society. 
Last year, these numbered 10,500 members. Every one of these members does more or less missionary work, such as selling books, loaning or giving away tracts, obtaining subscriptions to our periodicals, visiting families, looking after the poor, aiding the sick, etc. Last year, they made 102,000 visits, wrote 40,000 letters, obtained 38,700 subscriptions to our periodicals, distributed 15,500,000 pages of reading matter, and 1,600,000 periodicals. Is there any question as to why they grew 400%? There's no question. These people were busy. What do you do during the week? It's not for you to answer. It's for you to think. What do you do during the week? God is trying to help us understand this, this, this is what happens when Jesus possesses the soul. That's what happens. When Jesus possesses the soul, we understand our homes are not our homes. Our homes are designed to bring the poor that are cast out to our house. That's Isaiah 58. Right there in verse 7, you know it. That's why God gives you a house. You want foreclosure protection? Let your house be the sanitarium that God called it to be. Let your house be a place that people can come and receive help. That is the best home insurance you could possibly buy. I'm very serious, brothers and sisters. Whenever I look at this, I say to myself, Father, show me how to temperately do more. If you're a homeschooling mother, you have no excuse. Are you kidding me? Read Welfare Ministry, page 120, if you're a homeschooling mother. Welfare Ministry, page 120, says very clearly that the mother is to train her children to be a helper to her as she goes to minister to others. So while our children are our first work, they're not your only work. You don't read that anywhere in Scripture. They're not your only work. You train them to help you so you can all go be a blessing to somebody else. And when you're a blessing to somebody else, mothers, that's the best training you can give to your children. Amen. They are watching mother put into action every morning and evening devotion. It's all laid out. It's all there. God has made it plain. What I'm showing you, my brothers and sisters, is that this Philadelphian spirit is what God wants to revive in us as he helps us overcome the Laodicean spirit. The selfish, self-centered, rich, thinking that we're all right spirit, God says, I want you to overcome that, but he wants to give us that Philadelphian spirit, that brotherly love that springs forth constantly from within, that we might be able to demonstrate the love of Jesus to others. That's why a church exists. There's no other reason. That's why we exist. And so I don't know about you, but I, I'm really, really exhausted with the status quo Adventist lifestyle that I see week in and week out, day in and day out. I'm tired of it. We just keep rehashing the same truths before each other. We've heard the messages over and over and over again. There are certain places I don't even like going there anymore. Literally, a friend of mine called me, Brother Lemon, can you come preach? I was like, no, I'm not going to preach anything. Why? I said, y'all heard the message a thousand times. When are you going to take what you heard and get to work? How about get to work? Stop this celebrity. Listen, here's something I'm learning to hate. <laughs> and I'm I, I am learning to hate this seven-day Adventist celebrity foolishness. I am serious. People treating you differently because you're whoever their name is, that, that name they like. I've watched that happen with my wife. I've literally seen people that will see my wife and they will not show her the level of respect that she deserves as a woman of God. But then all of a sudden, somebody says, Sister Lemon. And then they, oh, Sister Lemon? Dwayne, Dwayne Lemon? How are you? The same people that was rude to her. And now they treat her nice because she's the wife of the evangelist that they respect and like. That's hypocrisy. She deserves respect if she's walking off the street homeless. You understand that? 
there's this wicked thing happening at Adventism, this celebrity Seventh-day Advent. That stuff is purely of the devil. It has nothing to do with God. Let's invite him to our church so we can get a whole bunch of people to come so we can get a whole lot of offerings and money and da-da-da. It's, it's, it's like slick, worldly gimmicks that we are allowing to come into the Advent band. We're, we, we're doing everything but consecrating ourselves before God and pleading with him in an upper room experience that we might have power from heaven, Amen. that people will listen to whoever we are and say, you must have been with Jesus. Amen. There are certain places I will not go there anymore. I lied to you not. They called, Brother Lemon, will you come? No. Why? Because you heard the message a thousand times. There are groups right now that all they keep doing every year is just bringing a circulation of popular Adventist speakers. And I'm like, I don't know if that's in the blueprint. Did you know that even our camp meetings were not meant for Seventh-day Adventists only? They were not big old spirit of prophecy vomiting fests. Sometimes we have camp meetings and we, we, we think, all right, we're going to tell the Adventist band and we just, we Adventists and we're just, we're just hitting them. Boom, boom, boom. Giving them all sorts of quotations from the prophet, from the prophet, from the prophet, etc. And my thing is, brothers and sisters, did you know that in our pioneers day, did you know that camp meetings, number one, went longer than one week? They went on for weeks. Number two, they were very evangelistic. The messages were designed and catered to win the non-Seventh-day Adventists. That's, orig that's original style camp meetings. Even our camp meetings, to a very large degree, are not repeating what was successfully done in our times past. Ellen White would literally go and preach at Sunday churches. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Read the Loma Linda messages. Literally, she would go in and speak of her favorite subject, which was temperance. She would teach on the subject of temperance and health. And as she would teach on it in Sunday churches, you know what she would do next? Win the people's confidence. And as the people's confidence was won, oh, Sister White, can you tell us more? She would say, no problem. Come to our camp meeting. She would invite them to the camp meetings. Oh, man. And y'all going, boy, some people, I tell you, it's funny. Some people would stone Sister White. Because do you know what she did with some of those people who came to the camp meetings? She would let them come up and speak and say certain things to the group, to the people, about what they've been learning, what they've been hearing, what they've been studying, the blessings that they received. It's all in the Loma Linda messages. I was reading it. Because the Lord opened the door where I started going into Sunday churches teaching health reform. And so I'm carefully looking at the prophet, and my, my heart was rejoicing as I said, this is blueprint work. And I'm looking at that. I said, this is, this is beautiful. What I'm trying to tell you, my brothers and sisters, everything in the early days of our pioneers, it was evangelistic. It was not things being taught in such a way that only the SDA could appreciate it. It was taught in a way that everybody would appreciate it, regardless of the denomination and the group that they were coming from. And what I'm encouraging each and every one of us to understand you have a solemn responsibility. You got to receive the gospel that has the righteousness of God in it. And God says, I want it revealed. And I want you to reveal it to everyone that you come in contact with. And then I want you to watch how my people in times of old did it. And I want you to repeat history, the good side. Never since the days of our early pioneers have we seen such massive growth, good growth? I'm not just talking about bringing in a bunch of numbers, because some people will say that. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about just an influx of numbers. I've had, I've had evangelists. I know men who worked with, with all the different organizations in our church today, and they will tell me. I won't call their names, but they will tell me. They say, Brother Lemon, listen, man, sometimes there are evangelistic meetings that are done in certain countries, third world countries. They'll go to India, preach the gospel, come back after two weeks. Praise the Lord, 3,000 souls got baptized. And in my mind, I say, that just sounds strange. 
3,000 people get back in only a two-week campaign? Doesn't sound right. So one day I, I went to one of the evangelists. I said, I said be honest with me. What's up? What, help me understand. They said, can I tell you the truth? I said, yeah, please. They said, many of those people in India, when they accept Jesus, they add Jesus to the one million gods that they're already worshiping. Now, I'm not saying this for all campaigns, but there are campaigns when the report is given, it is not a very holistic, balanced report because many of us are trained to say praise the Lord because numbers came in. And I asked more than one. I started asking several evangelists that would go to third world countries, and a lot of times they say, yep, people just add Jesus to the several gods that they're already worshiping. In other words, there's not a true appeal. I've sat down with Muslim relations groups from GC down, literally from General Conference, and I sat down with these men. I, sat down, I was in Vietnam one time, and we were all sitting down together. And I said, so tell me about how you go about winning souls in the Muslim community. Oh, well, we befriend them. Did you know that there's a lot of relatability, et cetera, et cetera? And I said, praise the Lord. And I said, so let me ask you this. I said, when do you tell them to come out of Babylon? They said, oh. And again, this is not all groups. But they said, oh, well, 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 we don't tell them that. I said, you don't tell them that? They said, yes. Yeah. So we encourage them because they may end up losing their lives. I said, so did everybody. I said, what do you think about Nero's servants? When Nero's servant accepted Jesus under the ministry of Paul, you think that brother didn't know him and his family was going to lose their lives? But that didn't stop them from making a public demonstration that we are believers in Jesus Christ. So where do you get your philosophy from to keep it on the down low? Act like a Muslim on the outside and then live like a Christian on the inside. Where is that in the Bible? I said, I don't see that anywhere. I keep telling you, inspired problems, man-made solutions, that stuff never works. We need real evangelism. We need to see real repetition of history when people were preaching the word and folks were taking a stand for the word and they were willing to lose whatever they had to lose because whatever they lost it would pale in comparison to what Jesus gave up for them. Amen. God actually wants to revive that spirit in us. My hope and my prayer is that you'll cooperate with him. We've reached the conclusion of our study for the day. And I want to thank God for the picture of the early success of the Advent movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement. I thank God for that picture. And I'm glad I could leave that picture in your mind. My question is this. These people gave up money. They gave up time and effort. What are you willing to give up? I'm really serious about this, family. Um, we are living in a time of judgment, and God's going to hold all of us. This is me. This is you. He's going to hold all of us accountable for how we spend our money how we spend our time, how we spend our energy. He's going to hold us accountable. He's going to, he's going to require a, a return on investment for what he has given. When I think about how much of us waste our money, cars, clothes, housing, we waste a lot of God's money. And I promise you the Lord is speaking to my heart as I hope he's speaking to yours. A lot of us have wasted God's money. And God is, is, is he's going to hold us accountable for that. He's going to do that. And we got to make wrong right and let God guide us. But what I'm saying is, is that the time that you give, life is more than work. Life is more than business transactions all the time. There's people all around us that are dying in sin. And so my hope and my prayer is that you will take some serious looks at what we were as a movement in times past. And let God talk to your heart on what he wants you to be as we prepare to meet our God. Question, how many of us understood the study? Did we understand the study? Is there anybody who didn't understand the study? Anybody who said, I don't understand? Here's my next appeal. 
God will make it plain to you what this means. It is not my duty to do that in every specific detail. How many of you could say at this time in your life, you are ready by the grace of God to do whatever it takes to see this work revived in your own life personally and in the lives of others in this side of the vineyard in Oregon? How many of you say, I'm ready and I'm willing to cooperate with God and do whatever it takes? I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet. Do not stand if you don't, if you're not willing to do that. Please don't stand because the angels wouldn't want you to lie. The angels wouldn't want you to lie. The reason you're standing is because you're covenanting with God. I am willing to do whatever it takes. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. He will let you know what you need to do. Some of us have too much stuff. And he's going to tell you to downsize. He's going to tell you to change some things out, maybe get rid of some stuff. He's going to tell you to do that. Some of us, he's going to tell you to cut back on your time. Cut back on your time. You're giving up too much time towards things that are not worth giving it up for. Some of us are giving a lot of our energy to some things that has no bearing upon our future life and maybe not even really enough bearing on the present life. And God's going to call for a change. I don't know what it is that he's going to call you to do. I just know that he's going to make it clear. Because I am a living witness that that's what he does. He makes it clear what he wants. And we get the privilege of complying with him. And so for those of you standing, it's a very serious work that needs to be done. And it's going to require sacrifice on every level. And I believe that God will help you, will work in you and through you for his glory. And so I want to encourage you to please be faithful. Just understand that your standing right now, as well as your sitting, are both recorded by angels. And so if you're sitting, I, I appreciate you sitting. Uh, that's, 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 a, that's a point of honesty, but please don't think it virtuous. God wants all of us to participate in his work because the only reason he saves you is so you can serve. We are saved to serve. If you don't believe it, pick up that little book right here called Ministry of Healing. Read the chapter, Saved to Serve. You will see. That's why he saves you, that you might serve in his vineyard. If you're not from here, and obviously you're way out in other places, well, obviously, that makes sense. So I will make one last appeal. You may not be from here, but you know where you're from. And so even if it's not here, if you're willing to make a covenant with God that wherever you're from, you will go before the Lord in a very real covenant to say, whatever it takes. I am willing to cooperate with you that you might revive this spirit in my heart and use me to help revive that spirit in others. If that is the covenant you are willing to make, again, I am inviting you to stand to your feet. Amen. I want to thank God for the privilege for us to study his word. It's decision time, and we have made our decisions. And I'm thankful that God is long-suffering. He is merciful. We're not promised forever, family. Today, if you hear his voice, we're not supposed to harden our hearts. And so my hope and my prayer is that if there's any struggle in your heart, that you will allow God to get the victory, because there's no battle that is too hard for him to win. For those of you standing, 
you will need the endowment of God's Holy Spirit. You will not be able to do this by your own might, wisdom, or power, but only according to his grace. You will find that your happiest phase of life will be in ministering for the master. May God use you faithfully in the capacity he has called you. Let us all close with a word of prayer, and if we are able to, let's do it upon our knees. Heavenly Father, we praise you, O oh God, for the wonderful love of Jesus that is available to each and every one of us, that we can be co-laborers with you. Lord, this earth and all that is in it, it truly is beginning to grow strangely dim. This is a miracle, Father. For we know how much our hearts can be attached to the things and the spirit of this world. But Lord, we're praying that you would please perform a miracle in our hearts. That you would truly take our lives and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Grant us your Holy Spirit, Father, that we might receive the mind of Christ and have the power to live the life of Christ. And that we would do it for thy name's honor and glory and that you might be pleased. Bless my brothers and sisters who took their stand for you. Teach us, teach them the way in which you would have us go. Show us, Lord, what it is that is blocking us from receiving more of thy spirit, that we can do your work. Lord, if there be any in the room who are simply struggling at this time, and they can't make that commitment yet. I pray that thou may be merciful unto them. Make plain your words and your will for their lives. Help them, dear God, to see the greater surrender and the joy of surrender. That nothing would hinder them to coming to the master before it is too late. Thank you, Father, for this privilege and time that we've spent together one with another. Seal our decisions, we pray for eternity. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.